Many of you have been following the case of uh, Leela Cavett. This is the young woman who uh, disappeared from her home in Georgia. She's a young mom, a little two-year-old son named Camden. And if you have been keeping up on any of the contact on that, and, and Chris and I have been following this case really closely, we, uh, we found a couple of things that were really interesting. We decided just to throw those into a story map and, uh, and we'll, we'll kind of go through that story map and then tell you where you can find it. If, if you haven't found it already, it's in the community tab and we'll post it up again. But uh, Leela left home abruptly. No one could understand why. And she traveled to Florida where she met up with someone and disappeared. Well, as the cases unfolded, we've learned a lot more about who she met up with. And uh, as part of this, we thought we'd just take advantage of this technology of being able to show things. We leaned upon uh, people like Rob and Natalie, and we said, hey, let's start looking at this case a little differently. So I'm going to just walk through this story map so that you can go and do the same thing when you're ready. Um, but as we go through it, you're going to find there are a number of things. There are going to be maps. And, of course, we love maps. And these maps are made so that you can uh, move those around. You can interact with the map. You can zoom in on things. You can zoom out. You can, you can do all kinds of really fun things on the map while you're working. But down the side, we'll, we know that today a formal charges were filed against a guy named Shannon Damar Ryan in the case. So we're going to kind of tell you the end as we know it today. But then we're going to work backwards uh, from there and talk a little bit about some of the things that were found. So I'm going to come back to this affidavit in a minute that was filed that tells us the rest of the story. But Lila lived in Dawsonville, Georgia, and she was there with her family. And according to family members, she did something that was completely out of character. She just got up and left. Now, Two days before she left, or actually about a week before she left, she reached out to one of her sisters and they were having a FaceTime chat. And this was really important because there was no mention from her about anything that was going on in her life that would have suggested that she was leaving town. But all of a sudden we see this real interesting behavioral change, Chris, that maybe you can just chat a little bit about. But it was uh, the day before she disappears, she starts calling people and asking for money. She reaches out to the father of her child and he wires some money to the local Walmart store. And the Walmart store is located down here on the map. And, and uh, in fact, uh, we actually built in this story map a way for you to get there more quickly. Take me to the Walmart. If you click on that, it's going to take you right down to where the Walmart is. You can look around, kind of explore the area if you want, or we can go back to, to uh, where she was before. But she starts uh, calling in favors and she says, hey, I need some money. He wires 60 bucks to the Walmart. At about that same time, she also is reaching out to another family member and borrows some more money. And, uh, and then one of, our, um, one of our profiling evil family our members, and, yeah. Yeah, and Dra Latina, and, I, and people always smile when I say that, but Dra Latina, um, found some really cool things that that uh, I want you to just talk about. But first, take a moment and tell us about this abrupt behavioral change and why that's so important in an investigation. So uh, this is, goes back to the victimology uh, aspect. And and as Mike and I, uh, as Mike has shared, you know, one of our past videos, if you have not seen uh, go back uh, in, in our channel and you'll see a video on the victim continuum. Okay? The, in this particular situation, you know, you have uh, this young lady who seems to have somewhat of a stable uh, environment going on in a certain geographic region. And then all of a sudden, you know, you start seeing these types of behavioral changes. She's putting things on, on you know, uh, up for sale. She's... Uh, you know, uh, trying to get additional money. And this is kind of out of character. And then you start seeing, you know, this, this behavior start moving to another geographic location. Uh, but her son is also involved in the circumstance. So this, this automatically raises a lot of red flags and automatically it did, you know, with the family as a whole, uh, enough to where they immediately started to notify law enforcement. So the first thing an investigator would do is, so tell me about Lila, tell me about her. 
And then you would yeah. start looking for those ch shifts and change. Go ahead, Mike. And then we. No, so while, while you're hitting on that, I want Rob to kind of step in here and share why geography becomes so important in an investigation like this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so looking at an individual's behavior and people have patterns and their everyday life and geography is very key to understanding how people behave and they act. And when people are outside of what you could call their anchor points or home base, or they tend to act very differently. And so those are cues um, that you can um, identify through different means to identify that somebody is you know, out of the norm. They're not following their day-to-day -day path. Um, and so you can just use geography to also look at potential relationships as well. Where is somebody going? Who are they talking to? What are they doing? Why are they there? Why do they take that route? Uh, lots of questions all related around geography. What time of day? Uh, why would they be in that location um, at that time on that date or day of the week? There's all kinds of things uh, that you can look into the data, the geography, the terrain, the surrounding area, the imagery uh, to better understand why that person was there or potentially why they're there. So Rob, when you were plotting out um, potential routes of traffic, this makes pretty good sense to me to go from what is mark number three in the top of the screen down to number two where the Walmart is and maybe back and forth. Um, I know that the pathway that's going on the west side of the map and then down to the south is the direction toward Florida. But um, it's really because we don't know the behavior here, is it? We, because if she were stopping at Walmart en route to Florida, it would make sense to just travel straight on through from this point right here, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so why was that route taken? And so were there any other stops along the way as well? So trying to understand uh, leads to potential other questions and answers that can fill some gaps. Because if you identify another stop along that route, um, it may have some significant importance that may be that piece of information that really starts to paint that clearer picture of what's happening. Yeah, I, I really like that. So, so we see some additional behavior going on <clears throat> over that day, or and we we don't know whether she travels back and forth, but we see her, like you were saying, Chris, selling items. But then uh, Dra Latina found something that I think everybody missed, and this is folks where you play such an important role in these processes, as far as we're concerned in discovering we cannot get enough eyes law enforcement cannot get enough eyes on a project um but but here i just thought this was awesome uh when when she found that in the background and i'll just go back up here in the background on this screen from her facebook page most of us just looked at this and said oh she's looking at uh, headphones in reality we also can see that no, she was looking at this mail one dot or mail one dot com, or this dating site along the way, which starts to lean us toward this idea that social media is involved in this. So what are your thoughts there? You know, uh, well, yeah, I mean, you you now have some potential uh, elevation and risk level here uh, that she's gone from shopping to potentially meeting. Uh, somebody uh, out in the environment, which leaves all kinds of questions, right, that come to the surface. You know, is she supporting, you know, certain habits? Is she, you know, just kind of looking for, you know, Mr. Right uh, in the in the in the land of Cyberville, right? Uh, is she, you know, going through and we can just keep putting the list up. And this would be one of these cases, Mike, where I think you and I would both agree that we would get a sheet of paper out and we would start writing all of the, the whys, right? This is one of these. So why is she up there? Why, why, why? And then again, all those hows would start presenting themselves, um, you know, up, up front. So what do you think? Yeah, yeah, it's no, it's awesome. And, and and then as we as we move in this story map, we also could see there are links to go to newspaper articles, to video from news stations. But again, the, the this uh, story map is just kind of made to be really easy. So now we look at her pathway overall, the most probable pathway because unless there are other pieces of evidence like receipts from gas stations or 
convenience stores. We're, we're kind of guessing on where she is, but yeah. we know that she leaves sometime July 24th in actually her uh, white GMC pickup. We learned today from the affidavit that it was actually a GMC where everyone's been reporting for days that it was a Chevrolet uh, pickup. Um, she, she drives, we think, around nine hours because that's how long the routing suggests she should be taking. And she ends up at a Cracker Barrel uh, in uh, Florida. And, uh, and there we see CCTV capturing uh, her on, on camera. This brings out a really neat thing that I just wanted to chat with, uh, with both you and Rob about, is the availability of CCTV in buildings, in on freeways, everywhere else nowadays, and how valuable that is for law enforcement. So Rob, I'll let you take that first, and then Chris, you fill in the blanks. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I think CCTV, as we've seen in some major cases over the years, I mean, look at the, the Boston bombing, that I think that was a case that I don't think would have unfolded as quickly as it did um, without all that CCTV uh, footage that was combed over and key pieces of intelligence and information were discovered. Um, I'd also like to throw out that nowadays, um, the number of cameras on people's doorsteps and how many cases and information um, I just know the other day there was some packages stolen in the neighborhood next to us and they caught the truck on one of those cameras on the way out. And so That's that awesome. information goes over social media and I'm, I'm, I would assume I didn't follow up, but I would assume they already found the guy. So cameras are everywhere and uh, that information, but like you said before, you need the eyeballs, you need, um, you need people to comb through that. And that's where, you know, crowdsourcing or people, um, getting involved to look over publicly available information and having a sharp eye could really help law enforcement uh, get to the right information. Yeah. So, Chris, how do we use this kind of information like CCTV to support a story or impeach a suspect or how do we use that in an investigation? Yeah, the, the old, um, hey, the bank camera caught you um, when there was no bank camera. Right. But in today's day, uh, they actually exist. Uh, and so you have all of this and they're called VMS, right? Video management systems. Uh, and these VMF systems are just phenomenal for uh, solving crimes, uh, because as you can see here, you know, you have a whole bunch of video information that shows up. And from there, an investigator can you know do a snapshot do a do a trap on that uh, particular picture and then of course that again is released into the public and our family members here you know on pe and others you folks you know see this you're this is a perfect example that mike's laying out here tonight you folks have seen stuff that i i haven't seen reported yet okay but it exists. I'm sure it's behind the scenes. They've seen some things, uh, but you know, you just seeing the fact that she was looking at dating sites uh, is a perfect testament to the power of uh, video management systems. Uh, a lot of folks see that when she comes out of the Cracker Barrel, I couldn't tell if she was holding her cell phone or if she's holding her purse and her cell phone. But that if in fact the investigators are looking for her, and when she's coming out of the Cracker Barrel, you would see that picture. And we can go back to that later, Mike. But you, you'll see there's a it looks like her. she's holding some type of phone device. If that's the case, you not only have a picture of that cell phone. Now you as an investigator can start looking for tower pings and see if you can you know, you know start tying stuff in from that. Yeah. Just a shout out to Don real fast, too. Thank you, Don. Go ahead. That, so um, that's really cool. So, Rob. Um, something really powerful pops up in this map as we look at it, and that is the state of Florida's camera systems. And some states we've watched have full motion video going the whole time. Others have snapshots that they take. But how valuable is this in being able to identify a true person's route and what's going on, how many people in the car, everything else? Yeah, absolutely key. Uh, did they change vehicles? Which uh, direction were they headed? Where's the last known location? Um, and understanding that direction and last known location is, is absolutely key and can really limit the geography uh, that you need to continue uh, looking at for your investigation. 
Yeah, it's it's so cool. So so now we see um, we see Leela showing up, and she's made it to Fort Lauderdale and that area around there, Miramar, Hollywood, and she's bouncing back and forth between locations. And we know this because they've gathered and collected the cell phone data, and they've been able to manage that. We also learn a lot from Ryan, who now is starting to become a suspect toward the end. But uh, what happens is we pick up a couple of really neat images uh, here of Leela as she's running from and back to a gold Lexus that is later identified as Ryan's car. Now, the thing that's kind of cool on the map here is we see two things that become pre predominant in this particular case. One is the racetrack, uh, which is the little convenience store. And the second is the Walmart that's located here in center screen where her vehicle's recovered. And uh, I don't know exactly where the vehicle's recovered, but, but we see now that this uh, connection occurs. And folks, if you go back to the video we did earlier on crime scene locations, think about the fact that there are three crime scene locations. There is the initial contact site. Now, some could theorize that the initial contact site was really that piece of social media, couldn't they, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That could have been the very first, yep. Yeah. Now, maybe it was just happen chance, but what we learned through the investigation is that uh, Leela had actually been communicating with this um, Ryan fellow who considered himself to be a witch doctor since early January. So we see that this connection is coming together. And so the initial contact site may have been much earlier, but theoretically, we can pretty comfortably say it was virtual that this initial contact for this criminal episode occurs. Then we have um, two other locations, and we don't frankly know what those are yet. The, the second is the crime scene location. It very well could be at this very moment when an abduction occurs or something nefarious happens. And then, of course, the final crime scene would be the disposal site or where um, Leela is recovered, uh, found walking along the street or whatever the case may be. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it might uh, be a recovery rather than, than finding this woman. But uh, go back and look at those videos. And like Chris said, go back and look at our video on victim risk assessment because this woman's risk changes dramatically because of the circumstances and the environment she's in. What really became troubling to us is today as we read the affidavit on this Ryan and you've had the chance to watch him and, and hopefully you've watched him in the little videos and I'm going to just skip ahead so that you can come back and, and watch this later. But this fellow just rants and raids uh, and goes on about uh, what uh, his life is like and how he's being punished by the police. Uh, so please go back and take a look at this. Uh, but what we find in the end in the affidavit that is uh, submitted by, uh, by the police at uh, the hearing today Yep. is that there were a number of things that were very troubling and uh, and they point very strongly to Ryan having a much deeper knowledge. I think the most egregious thing that was, uh, was really troubling people was the fact that this little two-year-old Camden was left on the roadside. Chris? Yeah, no, so that would go towards uh, consciousness of guilt, Mike, in the, in the interview room, right? And so guys and gals, so one of the things now that the investigators uh, you know, had to get to after they hooked him up, after they arrested him. And, you know, you put him in that interview room and you want to have that information that you have not presented in a public forum still with inside of your toolkit. Uh, and then if he starts presenting uh, ideas, I mean, if, if you get a chance, go look at the, you know, the video he put up on YouTube, you know, he seems a little, you know, like he's just not Raptor type, right? And then, you know, he's talking about being a, you know, a witch doctor and all this other stuff. But at the same time, now an investigator, you know, has to start thinking about defenses. You know, is this guy going to come into court and start pleading certain things? Uh, and so you've got to be very, very methodical in how you interview this particular subject, um, that he has to understand right and wrong. And a lot of his actions that he took, which will be shown on potentially some of the video uh, uh, evidence. One of them is dropping the child off at uh, Walmart uh, when he brought the child back there, uh, according to 
the information that's available, uh, that's going to be critical because that's going to go towards consciousness of guilt and the capability to make conscious decisions about criminal activity. So yeah, just just one point of clarification, Chris, yeah. um, and I don't think you meant to say that, but um, <laughs> Leela picked up and met, it appears, Ryan at the convenience store, which is number seven here. The Walmart is number 13. But Camden was actually dropped about two and a half miles away near this apartment complex, not at the Walmart, but at, near this apartment complex. The thing that's so uh, critical here is that Ryan's testimony early on was that he saw uh, Leela and Camden load into a vehicle with two black males, an unknown dark sedan, and leave the area. We've seen this so many times when when um, suspects in crimes provide misleading information. Well, what, what the affidavit shows today is that clearly um, he's the one that drove the child to this complex and dropped the child off. Not only CCTV, but camera, I mean, uh, cell phone pings cell phone put pings. him there. And uh, to al alleviate some of our fears, this little child didn't wander two and a half miles on their own. It was only a matter of 30 minutes or so before a passerby noticed the child and got help for the child. Now, the two days previous under this person's care and under a mom's care who's um, influenced by other thought processes is, is a little troubling, but um, I, I thought we should just clarify that. But we would invite you folks, uh, as you um, look at this, to go and we'll put up again the link for this story map, go through, have some fun with it, uh, explore a little bit and uh, see what you come up with and then continue to weigh in because this woman hasn't been recovered yet, Rob. And, and I think one of the things that was troubling to Chris and me was that the, the uh, suspect Ryan was caught on CCTV also using a debit card, I believe that belonged to Leela at a local, at that same local Walmart. And there were two things that were troubling. One is that he was buying large plastic trash bags and odor eater carpet disinfectant and duct tape. The second thing that really frightens me, quite frankly, is that he was doing Google searches on his phone for what time the trash is dumped behind the racetrack and the Walmart. And hopefully that's led investigators appropriately so to go back there. But, um, but Rob, w now using GIS and having that kind of information, what, what kind of opportunities does GIS open up for the law enforcement community in searching for this person? Well, I think it helps with the focus. So knowing those areas, um, if there's searches about the racetrack and the trash, uh, being able to just hone in and understand timelines and then gaps in those timelines so that they can hone in and find um, what may have happened and look for additional information, try to look at businesses, things like that, and try to correlate that individual's movement um, in, during a time period where it might not be known um, what they were doing. Yeah. You know, Chris, from a probability and possibility standpoint, a lot of people have rightly weighed in thinking, oh, you got to look for the Everglades and dumping a body in the woods. And But all of a sudden now you have this really prescriptive piece of information. Um, how does that change uh, your most probable places to look? You know, one of the first considerations is time. How much time does an offender have uh, with victim? And you know, that is, the, that is a, a, a perpetrator's largest enemy uh, because that cl clock is ticking and the paranoia sits in and there they find themselves, you know, sitting in a, a situation that uh, if it's an organized, you know, situation, which, you know, we have some elements of an organizational, you know, um, type of uh, physical evidence that's saying, you know, with the duct tape, the bags and all the other stuff, right? This guy is, he's consciously making decisions. So he knows he has this problem now. Uh, and so now he's looking for a way out. So you have to, you have to ask yourself, okay, so if he's looking for the dumpster times, 
the the trash times. Yeah, that's a probability that he could be, you know, tossing that victim into one of those dumpsters and anticipating it's going to get to the landfill and, you know, the cops would never find it. Okay. But he's actually fighting his own uh, war within, and that is the time war. Uh, if he puts a victim in the trunk of a car, he's got a transport problem that goes up against time because he's he or she is always consciously thinking about, is there a cop behind me? I mean, for goodness sakes, I drive to the store and I constantly am looking in my mirror, you know, hoping there's not a cop behind me, okay? Can you imagine if you had a body in the trunk, what's going through yeah. their minds, okay? Now, add, add to that uh, Florida heat and moisture. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it, in in a trunk, I mean, talk about an oven, and uh, that's going to be a problem that's going to extend beyond just can I get away with it visually? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Michael. Wow. Well, this is an amazing case that I think uh, we're just starting to see the beginnings of. We're we're going to continue to look for this woman, and hopefully, they're going to find her. Hopefully, they find her safely. Um, I, I think, again, it's probably more like a recovery based on what we're seeing, and I hope that's not the case. Uh, her family jumped right in and went down there and has been working very closely with law enforcement. Law enforcement, I think, has been working around the clock. But now we're seeing some other tentacles of a case that we talked about a short time ago, and that was the Lauren Domolo case, and people suggesting that maybe there were some relational things uh, there as well. So, folks, there's a lot more to come on this uh, and we don't know we don't know the answers yet, but uh, this is going to be an interesting case to follow up. So uh, yeah. please continue to weigh in on that.